Um, yeah. You know, it becomes an ugly thing in the congregation when the congregation takes the authority back that they've granted. And most of the time, the pastor who's being abusive or being a bully at that point thinks that they have authority that they don't have anymore. Right. So, but authority is an important thing. So keep that in mind. So the faith of the preacher, the passion of the preacher, the authority of the preacher, and then the grace that a preacher has to be able to exude. Uh, as he says, a preacher is not only a preacher, but also a listener. Yes. And then that's when he does get into that whole point about the listener uh, or the congregation and how they speak as well. And it's like I said a moment ago, the listener speaks just by being a part of the community of faith that the preacher is constantly ministering to. So, mm -hmm. um, he does say another thing that I thought was important on page 26 in the book that you and I have, uh, the third and final statement about preaching generated by the conviction that listeners are vital contributors is that sermons should be, uh, should speak both for and to the congregation. Right. So uh, in many cases, the sermon will actually say, this is what we believe. This is what we stand for. And so again, it's the preacher who's up there on the bully pulpit, pulpit trumpeting the faith to the world on behalf of the congregation, speaking for the congregation. So that's when the congregations are oftentimes out there saying, amen, absolutely. That's exactly what we believe. Yes, tell them, preacher. Uh, yeah. but then sometimes the preacher is not speaking just on behalf of or for the congregation, but actually speaking to the congregation. It's like, you know, um, yeah, guys, uh, last week that African-American couple who tried to come in here wasn't treated very pretty, wasn't treated very fairly at all. And that indicates that there may be still a vestige of racism that's uh, going through our congregation and we need to have a conversation. It, it might not feel good to have that conversation, but that's a congregation that that's a conversation that has to go to the congregation. Right. Um, about our faith. So, and then he talks about the primary role of the scriptures. Um, and the last thing he talks about is the Holy spirit. So the scripture and the Holy spirit you know, the scriptures are non-negotiable. I mean, you know, these are the, the ruling documents of the church. So when we're preaching from the Bible, as long as we're preaching authentically from the Bible, then it can't be questioned. I mean, at the end of right. the day, that's what preachers often say is, you know, you might've got mad at that sermon that I preached this morning, but don't get mad at me. I'm just a messenger boy. God's the one who said it. Right. right. Um, right. Good illustration of that is uh, Clarence Jordan which is the guy who found the Koinonia farms down in America's Georgia. And I may have talked about him before with some of you all, but if not, you will be hearing about him. If you take the uh, Koinonia class with me, uh, he was a basically a modern day prophet. And when he spoke, he spoke to the congregation, to the church about the things they needed to hear as much as speaking for the church. And he spoke from the scripture. He talked about racism. He talked about all kinds of problems that were vestiges of the past. And he was still living at a time when a lot of people, their grandparents fought in the Civil War. You know, I mean, he was, he was in the early 1900s. When the 1860s, you're talking about Civil War, right? So um, his, he said there was this one lady in the congregation. He was preaching one day, and he was talking about uh, the Confederacy and, and the desire of the Confederacy to break away from the union for the purpose of maintaining the slave culture and everything and how wrong that was biblically. And he said, he could just tell that woman just wasn't having anything of what he was saying. And she was mad as fire. And when she come out, he said, I could see her coming down the road, you know, preacher standing at the back door, shaking hands. And uh, when she got up to him, she said, I'll never believe anything that you say from that pulpit that you preached this morning because my granddaddy fought in the civil war on the Southern side. And he said, all I could do at that point was just acknowledge the truth of the matter. He says, well, I see you've chosen to follow your grandfather instead of Jesus Christ. And that's your choice. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, yeah. The scriptures speak pretty clearly. You can't both be a racist and a Christian. That just, it, it don't work that way. That's right. And so then he talks about the Holy spirit, you know, empowering those words. And, uh, you know, it's a funny thing because preachers will tell you if they've been preaching very long that somebody almost invariably will get you at the back door at some point in your ministry if you're preaching and say, you know, what you said about such and so this morning, that really hit me in a way that I've never thought of before. And you think about what they said when you get out of the, con out of the congregation and then you say, I, I don't remember saying anything about that this morning. And then you go back and you listen to the audio tape because maybe the church was taping your sermon. And in fact, right. you didn't say anything about it. 
Well, God has a way of taking the words when they come out of our mouth and twisting them and shaping them just what the person needs before they go into their ears. Right, so, right. You might not have said a thing in the world about it, but God had a way of making what you did say touch what they needed touch to hear and give them revelation in a way that maybe they've never had it before. And they give you the credit for it, but God's the one who deserves the credit for the spirit. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but that brings the introduction sort of to a conclusion. I mean, any other thoughts or questions or. No, that was um, pretty straightforward. Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Um, chapter two. Yeah. Uh, some notes that I, I you know, take to uh, had taken down was again just you know talking more about you know the importance of understanding your listeners yes. um which kind of piggybacked off of what we were just talking about from the first chapter um where it talks about it not being just communication itself but it's an oral communication um yes and, and understanding like you were saying you know those that will be receiving and, and how to potentially maybe I don't know if targets is the right thing, but just kind of yeah. looking for certain aspects within that context of the listener. Um, and then, you know, going through it had the different contexts. Um, so, and I'll kind of tell you what I got from it. Maybe yeah. if it's yeah. basic, you can tell me, but like the pastoral context, I was kind of grouping that up as basically like that interaction with the members that are receiving the message and understanding them and, and how to interact in that fashion. Well, before you even get to that one, back up to the historical context, because that's the, the beginning of that part of that chapter. He's talking about the fact that we all have heard sermons all of our lives yeah. and we've been in a, particular church all of our lives and if you're preaching in that church and there's been a preacher who's been there for 40 years and they just left don't think that you're just going to come in there and preach and that they're not going to hear the culmination right. of all the sermons they've heard all their life including the, that minister who was there before them and as he said don't try to um, yeah don't try to compete don't try to push that guy or that girl out of the way out of their people's minds just realize that god's called you to do what you're doing right now and that you're doing it in a historical context yeah. Yeah. The, the notes I had, for, I guess I had those out of order, but yeah, the notes I had for the uh, historical was, you know, both, both the minister and the listener will have the recollection to someone or a group of people who, who drive what preaching is to them. Absolutely. Don't be competing, you know, yep. not to compete with prior messages or, or prior delivers, like you were saying, yeah. um, that the tradition the traditions hold a place in the historical context of preaching. Absolutely. Uh, let's see, you know, the knowledge of the, the historical context allows to pull us back into focus. When we start to wander, mm -hmm. it allows for constructive self evaluation of, of your own performance in, in what you're doing. And it helps provide a guide to developing and, 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 not just developing, but also putting out the product of a sermon, I guess. Yes. And I don't know. Yeah. You know, some of my language sometimes like the product of a sermon. I'm not trying to say it like it's oh, yeah. uh, I think a commercialized that, thing, but just, you know, what it's intended to do. Right. Exactly. And that's the thing is if you think about it, for, and if, the further you read in this book, the more you're going to hear him say that. What you're thinking about from the very get go is what am um, I trying to accomplish with this sermon? What is this sermon trying to do? That's exactly right. Then you ask yourself, what is the best form for that to happen in? So if the sermon is a sermon that is designed to shock, because sometimes there's value in shock. A shock value is not a bad thing in the church. I mean, you don't want to be sensationalizing the sermon every week. You're not getting there just trying to be a shock jock in the pulpit. But sometimes you want to say something that is completely out of the ordinary, you know? Um, and so how do you formulate the sermon in such a way as that it brings a shock? Cause what you're ultimately trying to get at, and, and this again is getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, but I just want to kind of give you a context of what you're talking about. When you do the study, you're going to have a revelatory moment. You're going to have an aha moment that whatever happens that God gives you the message. 
So then now you're asking yourself the question, how do I get the congregation to have that same moment that I just had without them going through the same study and all the stuff that, that led me to it? Because obviously they're not going to get as deeply as involved in exegetical research as the pastor is all week long in that passage. Right. So how do you get them to have that same moment? And so, like I said, if that, if it's a shock, then you want to try to figure out what form is going to best help you to do that. If it's a, a, a joy, let's say it's a, maybe God struck you something funny in the text and it was so funny. You thought, wow, that's what my congregation needs. They need to laugh. And the Bible says that their uh, laughter is doth, doth the heart good like medicine sometimes. And this week, what God wants is for them just to have a good belly laugh. And how are you going to bring that laugh out? You know, um, a joke is a good form for a laugh, right? Whereas a joke may not be the best form for a sermon every week. You know, it might be in this particular case, the form is necessary for what you're going for. Right. That makes sense. Yes, sir. So I think that's exactly right. And, and see, he says that on page 37 in that history, the historical context part, that some people get locked into a form of preaching every week to think that they, if they're not preaching that same form every week, then they're not preaching. Because in their mind, again, the historical part of their context is, well, the greatest preacher I ever remember was my preacher growing up, and he preached that same three points in a poem every Sunday. And if I don't do that, then I'm not preaching. Or if I'm not yelling at the top of my voice and making my, you know, my carotid arteries throb, then I'm not preaching because that's how the preachers used to do it back in the old days. And as right. he says here, he says on the bottom of page 36 and into the top of page 37 where he says that, he says, a study of the history of preaching reveals that forms and modes and styles are relative to times and places and the context and audiences. The gospel is the gospel, but it, in its movement across time and cultures, its witnesses have learned, have listened to the counsel of rhetoric, communication theory, literary criticism, and skilled communicators in every field. A style or method can outlive its usefulness, but abandoning it is not easy to change, maybe to experience as, quote, not preaching anymore. Some preachers who modify their styles confess that they have feelings that they have betrayed an old homiletics professor, a long since deceased uh, preacher or friend, and change is difficult. So just knowing that you should not be married to a particular form or style, and that style changes. Okay. And it's usually contextually defined. And as he says here too, some forms or styles are of sermons or of communication are either are uh, either not congenial to the nature of the gospel or poorly fitted to the human ear. For example, there are reasons why a parable can convey the gospel while a riddle can. Mm. So, you know, a parable is not unlike a riddle in some ways because it doesn't give you everything and it allows you to come to some conclusions for yourself. But at the same time, right. it's not designed to, um, it's not designed to deceive, not, I won't say deceive, but to try to hinder you out of some sense of, a riddle is almost a desire that you don't get it. I mean, like the guy who's right, doing right. the riddle, the Sphinx doesn't give you the riddle because they want you to get it. Right. It's a very rare possibility that you might get it, and they and the Sphinx would actually acknowledge that. And if you get it, you get to pass, right? Right. But the odds are you're not going to get it. It's it's shrouded in mystery on purpose. The sermon is not supposed to be shrouded in mystery on purpose. Um, it does and can use mystery. It does and can use um, analogy, form, symbol, other things to try to convey that would allow you to come to a sense of revelation without me just spoon feeding it to you. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, that's the historical context. And then you were talking about the pastoral context. And that's exactly right. That's looking at the people in the congregation, thinking about what they're going through. You know, uh, Kristen and Nick has got two kids. One of them's just started school. The other one's in preschool. Uh, Nick is working uh, 40 hours a week plus now because of the hurricanes. What, what, you know, what do they need to hear this week on Sunday morning? Right. Yeah. He was talking about how that creates that movement in the, in the, uh, in the message. Yep. Um, 
Let's see. Let's see what else I put there. Yeah, just relating the uh, parishioners and the sermon creates the movement in the messages, understanding of the audience being critical. Yeah, um, absolutely. And knowing that man. because because the context now is that you're oftentimes preaching to a group of people who are highly educated. Um, you know, my preacher, when I was 12 years old, preached to a bunch of farmers who right. probably had a high school education at best. And a lot of them dropped out of school. My uncle dropped out of fifth grade, and he's one of the biggest farmers oh, yeah. in Craven County. And yeah. so he doesn't have a technical education, and if the preacher stood in the pulpit and quoted uh, Homer's The uh, Odyssey and the Iliad, you know, or something like that, he would have no clue what he's talking about. But right. now you're talking to lawyers, doctors, nurses, uh, pharmacists, people who are uh, highly professional, and they've had a pretty good uh, college education. So you might be able to make some of those, you know, connections to great literature. Um, so, yeah, that's it. You just know when your congregation is going to help with that. And then uh, the liturgical context. What, yes. Did you have anything else on the pastoral? Or no, that, no, no, that's right. no, that's right. That's that's good. We can move on to that. That's good. Um, yes, yeah, so my takeaway from that was that the process of worship takes um, the focus away from the preacher, the person delivering the message, places it on the word that's being shared so that the focus is directed at the proper place. And yes. it's not for for the lights to be shining on you saying I'm bringing this message is for the actual message itself versus yeah. um, the other. And the other side of that uh, in the liturgical sense, the sermon is only one part of worship. Um, a lot of right. times we have a tendency, especially in the Protestant church to think that the sermon is the only part of worship that's important. And that's why most churches, um, you may or may not know this, but most Protestant churches have the pulpit, like Baptist churches, especially where we're really high on the word. We have the pulpit right in the center of the church. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of churches will have the pulpit off to one side. If you go into like uh, a, a high liturgical church, uh, Presbyterian or Methodist, some Methodist churches, um, you might find that there is a pulpit on the side of the wall or over here and the Lord's table is in the center mm -hmm. because for them, the Eucharist is central and the word serves the purpose of the Eucharist, right? right. Uh, most Baptist churches will have the pul pulpit right in the center, but they will also have the Lord's table right in the center. And in baptism is right behind the choir loft in the center also. So all right. three of those sacramental things for us, and we wouldn't necessarily, I mean, even some Baptist churches wouldn't go so far as to call them sacraments. They would call them ordinances. But right. they're important, so that's why we put them in the center of the church, right? But what I'm trying to get at is I think he's right in pointing out that the uh, sermon is a part of a liturgical context that the whole story of salvation history is, is meant to be told in the entire liturgy. So liturgy becomes worship and ser the sermon becomes one part of that. And it's not any more special than the Eucharist, which hopefully if a church is doing a Eucharist every Sunday, a lot of churches do, then that's a good, that's a good thing. Um, the singing of the songs of Zion, you know, the songs of God saving us at the edge of the Red Sea and saving us through the blood and the, and the power of the blood of the lamb and, and washed in the blood and all that kind of stuff. All of that's a part of salvation history, singing, offering and giving our gifts to the Lord is a part of worship. And then coming to the, you know, uh, the sermon is worship. So um, oftentimes the church that's doing both Eucharist and the word will do what they call word and table. So they'll preach and then they'll have the Eucharist right after the preaching so that the congregation can have a form of response. Right. Um, the Baptist churches a lot of times will do the preaching and they won't have Eucharist, but every Sunday they'll do that at special occasions. And then they'll have right. the altar call, which is yes. a form of response. <laughs> so, right. but either way, that, that opportunity for response is as important as the spoken word. Right. 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 So like you say, it's, it's something that the preacher doesn't need to get a big ego and say, thank goodness I'm here because worship couldn't happen if it weren't for the sermon. Right. You know, we could actually have worship without a sermon, just like you can have worship without the Eucharist, just like you can have worship without music, 
It just is a truncated experience of worship. It's better when you have it all. Right. So, and he made a point that sometimes you have to worship um, in a, or preach at a civic club or a Ruotan or something like that, where they're not going to, I mean, the most singing you might get is the Star Spangled Banner or something like that, like he said. Yeah, yeah, where he was talking also like, you know, like you're saying at these different places where it's not in your normal environment where it's, you know, set. Right. The table's not set like normal. So yeah, right. to go in there and, and, and remain focused and, and be able to deliver. And realize that at that point, maybe the sermon does have to carry a little bit more theological and, and, and liturgical freight because there's right. not the songs that are backing you up. The Eucharist is backing you up and the offering. You know, right. you are to speak a word from God to a group of people who are gathered not for worship. Right. You know, but it's a privilege. It's an honor, and you don't you don't dare turn it down. Like he said, it's an opportunity. Right. Uh, then he went to theological context. Um, where he was talking about preaching itself being a theological act, telling and conducting. Um, you know, reporting and participating in the event, um, that the relationship of, you know, preaching and theology must be addressed, that it's the mutuality between the two, right. that's, you know, it's focused on and, and not trivial. Um, yes, yes, yes. The, theologically, it is kind of similar in the concepts and preaching is more of the concrete, you know, graphic, the vocabulary. Yep. Uh, as a separation of those um, two things. Um, well, and you know, I think he makes a good point too about realizing that the necessary part of a pastor preaching appropriately is to get um, solid theology into the minds of the people in the congregation, because where else are they going to get it? They're not going to study theology right. like you and I have done at Mount Olive in a theology class. So probably most right. of the people in our congregations have no concept or idea about homoousias or, uh, you know, Athanasius and uh, Arius talking about whether Jesus was really God in the flesh or whether he was the son from the very beginning or whether he somehow became the son of God as a man who was born and didn't exist pre but now because god adopted him somehow or adoptionism subordinationism none of those theological terms are running through the vocabulary of our people right. but those are things that we've learned and we've studied from the word and now we know solidly that this is good orthodox theology of the church thousands of years of conversation of people who before us and people who will be here after us let's be honest if christ tarries um that solid theology is what our people need to hear and mm -hmm. What we find a lot of times in preaching is, is preaching is a, um, an easy task in some regards because, you know, the old joke that the congregation makes about the preacher working one day on Sunday a week and getting a full-time payment pay salary, it can be true. There are people who go into the work of the ministry to try to hide from work because they're lazy. And so they don't, you know, and, and if you're, if you're going in at that, and I don't think it's, that's what you're doing. I don't think that's what I'm doing. I don't think that's what Jacob's doing, but I do think there are people who try to hide from real, real work and ministry. And to do that, what you end up doing is you end up giving your congregation sugar smacks and fruit loops every yeah. Sunday. Mm -hmm. And you know, like I know that that might not harm your children one morning a week, but seven mornings a week, sugar smacks and Fruit Loops are going to end up causing diabetes and, and other kinds of health problems for your children. Yeah. So for your children to get what's really good, you're going to have to get up and you're going to have to cut some fruit and some vegetables and put that out on the table. And that's going to take a little work. You don't just get up and, and wash you know, a couple of apples and some bananas and some uh, fruit and make a fruit tray for your kids for breakfast uh, and then to get them to eat it. You know, that's the other side. You know they need it, and do they want it? No, they want the sugar smacks. Good God. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so what you'll run into as a minister, and I've run into this, is every week somebody come to me after I preached and says, well, Charles Stanley didn't say that this morning on TV. 
mm. or, you know, Charles Stanley or some other, or John Hagee or some other preacher on TV. And, and I was always thinking to myself, you know, there's a reason a lot of times why somebody who has a huge following has a huge following because people don't flock. Um, somebody said it one time before, and I don't mean this in any condescending way at all, but sure. hogs all run to the slop, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. And so you can draw a crowd real easy if you're just constantly passing out candy and, and nuts and, you know, everybody's having a good Christmas, as they'll say, and if, can, if everything was candy and nuts and everybody would have a good Christmas. But sometimes you need the orange and the apple in your stocking and not a candy cane, if that yeah. makes sense. Oh, yeah, for sure. So yeah. Nobody's going to respond to it sure, yeah. sometimes. They try yeah. to stay away from it because they know the truth is going to be exactly. challenging and gonna try to avoid it. Mm-hmm. I mean, every year we have this uh, conference at uh, Mount Olive for Free Will Baptist ministers and for all ministers in the uh, region, and it's really for laypersons too. And we call in um, a world-class scholar who is either at the top of their field in one of four different disciplines, theology, uh, history, uh, pastoral care, a spiritual formation, whatever. And I'm surprised year by year that the Free Will Baptist ministers, we got 250 churches. I've got about 500 ministers, 400 and some ministers. Um, I don't know why we have churches that don't have ministers when we have almost two ministers per every church, other than I know some people unscrupulously, unfortunately, I think, are probably ministers because it gives them certain uh, tax benefits or you know, you can take a housing allowance if you're a minister and all that kind of stuff. That's sad to think that that's true, but I don't know of any other way to explain having 400 ministers on roll in churches that have no ministers, but that's where we're at. We got 400 ministers, and I bet maybe 10 showed up uh, oh, wow. for this free conference that's going to tell them about you know issues of theology, practical theology, and where the rubber meets the road at in this world. I, I don't understand it, other yes. than the fact that people just won't the easy stuff, you know, if you, um, if you got some, one of these famous, uh, TV preachers like Benny Hinn, then I would imagine, you know, we'd probably have just people flock from all over, but why? Yeah. You know? So. Yeah. It's almost like, uh, it's almost like potentially you know they're afraid they might hear something that they feel like they have to enact upon which might make things more difficult for them absolutely that, that's exactly what it boils down to what and i'll tell you one of the reasons this week now everybody didn't know this because of the way his topics were but uh this week the guy that came talked to us about uh white privilege and racism that's still prevalent in our society and right. it was an eye-opening experience for many of us who have uh you know, probably come to a consensus that, oh, well, we've had a black president. We must be done with racism in America. <laughs> uh, some of the stuff that he helped us to see is things that he's seen because he lives in a black community. And he's a white man. He serves a black, a black church as a uh, associate minister, as a white man. Um, but he sees things that maybe I don't see, and he helped me to see those things. But, again, that, to me, I'm always wanting to grow, you know, and yeah. that's what the pastor ought to do and help the congregation to do. Yes. But um, unfortunately, a lot of pastors don't want to do that. And, and he talks about this on page 49 where he says, you know, uh, when preparing sermons, if preachers would write so what at the top of the page, many promotional talks like the clever word games, quote, salt shakers and light bulbs would quietly slip off the desk and hide the wastebasket, hide in the wastebasket. Theology urges upon the pulpit a much larger agenda, creation, evil, grace, covenant, forgiveness, judgment, suffering, care of the earth and all of God's creatures, justice, love, reconciliation to the word of God. You know, all of those things are a lot better than that trivial, you know, little, like I say, you know, sprinkles of Jesus, you know, so. Mm. Yes, sir. Small topics, he says, are like pennies. When polished to a high gloss in the end, they're still just a penny. That's right. <laughs> they look better. Yeah, <laughs> they, exactly. Oh, yeah, they're tasty. I'm telling you, like I said, sugar smacks and, and Fruit Loops and Captain Crunch, man, I'd rather have that any day than what I know is good for me. 
That's but right. In the end of the day, it's those decisions we make on a regular basis that make us who we are over time. That's right. Yes, sir. All right. Well, that kind of brings us to a close on chapter two. Yes, sir. Now let's talk about chapter three a little bit. You got things now, to check out. Three, I, don't, I don't have a lot of notes here. Um, I had, when I was going through chapter three, I had a pretty decent headache. And oh, okay. All right. I, I, I mean, the gist of it from what I was getting, uh, you know, I had to reread a couple paragraphs just to, you know, remain focused on it. But um, so I was talking about the silence. Um, and I think kind of goes back to, um, a lot of relational things where it was relating scripture to it. Right. Um, where in the scriptures it speaks, sometimes there is, you know, God's going to be silent. Yeah. Well, and, and, and oftentimes when he is silent, it's a pregnant pause. Hmm. Um, it's like it's silence for the purpose of dramatic effect. It's hmm. not. Just uh, because there is the dark night of soul, uh, dark night of soul we learned about too in spiritual formation, where it seems like God is silent and He's just not talking. It's almost like He's got His back turned or He's gone on vacation. It's like God, I'm I'm dying over here. Where are you at? I I haven't heard from you. And God is being silent. But in this regard, it sounds like what He's trying to say is that that there's something in that silence that is burgeoning, and you know God is about to do something. Like in Genesis chapter one and verse one, before it all starts, you know, the spirit of God is hovering over the face of the deep and there's, there's silence and everything is chaotic, but all of a sudden God speaks and when he finally speaks, it's let there be light, let there be this, let there be that, you know? Mm -hmm. Uh, So when God speaks, you know, from the silence, you know, and then he talks about it even in revelation, you know, when the lamb broke the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for what seemed like a half an hour, you know, that, 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 it's like, I don't know how to even articulate it. It's like a pregnant pause is the best way I know how to say it. That all of a sudden, you know, something's coming. Yeah. It's a, like the anticipa- uh, anticipation. Of yeah. What's to come. Absolutely. That's the word I was looking for. Anticipation. Okay. Um. And, you know, uh, he highlights that iconic statement from Jeremiah uh, from the book of Jeremiah is actually from the king. Um, I think it's Zedekiah who says unto Jeremiah when he's called him in secret, because Jeremiah has been thrown into a, a cistern as punishment by the people who hate him. And the king has had him drawn up out of the cistern, which was a cistern, a cistern was like a big water cavern in the cave, in the uh, hewn out into the rocks of the desert. When it rained, they would save water. So whenever there was dry time, they would have water. Well, there was no water in the cistern except for a little bit of mud in the bottom. They throw Jeremiah down in it and we're going to just leave him there to die. I think the king found out about it and sent somebody to get Jeremiah and brought him to the palace and put him in the, in the prison stocks there in the palace. And he'd call him from time to time and have a conversation with him. And so he called Jeremiah to him and he said, is there a word from the Lord? Mm. And in the black church, you know, that's that, that cadence that that black preaching uh, tradition gets into, that hoop that they call it, where they, uh, they use that passage of Scripture quite often. Is there a word from the Lord? Mm. Because Jeremiah said to Zedekiah when he said that, you know there is a word from the Lord, you just don't want to hear it. You know? <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. And that's how the congregation comes to the to, to the church each week, there, there is a word from the Lord. And oftentimes that word is heard in a whisper, which is what he talks about next. It comes from silence and heard in a whisper in the preacher's study, but you've got to deliver that news. And uh, I wrote in the margin of my book on page 54, Mm -hmm. um, the sick loved one is in surgery. And then the nurse comes out, you know, that you knew went into the surgery with your loved one. And when you yeah. see them come through that door, what's the first thing that you're thinking in your mind? Is there word? Is there yeah. any word? What's, what's the going update? On? Right, yeah. exactly. Uh-huh. And so give me the update. And so the preacher is that nurse that's walking from the operating room to the waiting area. Uh-huh. And the preacher has to bring that word. And sometimes the word is, yes, the surgery went well. The cancer was not spread. The doctor got it all. There won't even have to be any radiation or treatment or anything. And what does the congregation say? Amen. Yeah. Hallelujah. Salvation, right? But sometimes yeah. 
sometimes, unfortunately, they have to say, yeah, you know, it, it, it's really bad. We're going to have to do some real work here. It's getting ready to have to face some real challenges. Right. Um, and, and, you know, you don't want to have to be the person to deliver that news, but as a congreg- as a pastor, you do. You have to. Mm-hmm. Well, That's just good. like Jonathan this week, um, ironically, his name was Jonathan too. Um, Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, uh, he shared with us about the fact that the church still has work to do with racism. You would hope that it would be over by now and done with, but it's not. So. Right. Wow. For sure. That, that's a good, good way to, that, that helps out. Yeah. For that, for sure. Oh, I love that first statement he makes on page 55 and heard in a whisper. Yes. The silence surrounding God's activity and purposes have been broken, but not by our noisy opinions, by God's revelation. Yeah. And man, I'm telling you, there is something, Jonathan, about revelation that I have. The more I think about it, the more amazed and all I am of it, because when I when I don't see something, it's very difficult for somebody to get me to be convinced of seeing it. Because I'm pretty yeah. set in my ways most time. Most people are. But whenever God gives me that flash of inspiration, that moment of revelation, and I see it clearly, and like I, I really beat myself up and think to myself, how have I not seen this all these many years? You know, I mean, it's right here in front of me. I should have known this. And then I kind of get probably a little short with people thinking, how can you not see this? And I, I yeah. get that it took revelation for me to see it. Right. It's going to take revelation for them to see it. So what I need to start doing is being more in prayer for people and, and praying that God will give them the same gift of revelation he gave me. Right, right. That's good. All right, let's see. What else is he saying here? Okay, uh, I think he's still talking about this miracle of revelation. He's talking about um, uh, Mark, uh, in the Mark's gospel, uh, there's Jesus being crucified. It's on page 57. uh, It says, according to Mark, his disciples did not understand Jesus' ministry, especially when he began speaking of his death. Uh, Of course, they didn't have revelation at that point, right? But at the end... One denied him, one betrayed him. They all abandoned him and fled, and Jesus was crucified as politically dangerous. A Roman soldier was given the gift of uh, revelation and wow. confessed him to be the son of God before anybody else did. That's, that's powerful when you yeah. think about it. I mean, these guys walked with him for three years. He constantly told them, you know, hey, I'm going to have to go away. You're not going to like it, you know, uh, and when it happened, they didn't, none of them know what was going on. They were confused. Right. And here yeah. a Roman soldier, a Roman centurion says, man, he, he really was the son of God, wasn't he? <laughs> yeah, that's uh, yeah, it's powerful. That is. Let's see. Yeah, where it talks about uh, that we not be impatient or critical. Yeah, I got that mark too. I'm glad you brought that up. In the Gospels, who didn't see and hear what we see and hear. Like what you were saying is like they didn't yep. necessarily have everything that we have now. Right. And that is hard sometimes to put into context or just yeah. to be aware of that as you're sitting there you're like, Dang, you knucklehead, why didn't you see, you know? What, exactly, right. Why did you miss that? Why were you oblivious to something so obvious? Something, well, that, yeah. something that has been said in the church over the years is that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Yeah. Um, and John Maxwell used to say it also when he talked about leadership principles. I used to listen to John Maxwell a lot yeah. talking about leadership principles and stuff. And uh, he used to say that, uh, the reason why we can see farther down the road is because we stand on the shoulders of those who've gone before us, that's on the shoulders of our forebears, our forefathers and whatnot. And yeah. so we have a tendency to get a case of the big head because we can see farther than our parents could see. But yeah. we gotta, we got to remain humble because when we look down, we realize we're standing on their shoulders. Yes. Um, yeah. And obviously you can see farther when you're up higher. I mean, that's the whole point of having a vantage point, being in a high, the high, having the high ground, right, in the battlefield. Yeah. Yes. 
So, uh, yeah, um, the, Jonathan, this week when he was there preaching uh, to us and teaching to us on the Harris lecture, he's, uh, in one of his prayers, he prayed, uh, Lord, keep us mindful of the fact that we stand on the feet, we stand on the shoulders of many giants who've come before us and um, let us not look back, you know, in uh, disdain or disgust or anything like that on people who didn't seem to get it. And, and to be honest with you, let's not look around and disgust and disdain at people who don't get it now because some people still are not, you know, have not had that revelatory moment. Right. So, yeah, absolutely. The plain and often painful truth about a whisper is that not everyone hears it. According to accounts and acts of Paul's call to be an apostle to the Gentiles, his experience with the risen Christ occurred in the company of fellow travelers, but only Paul seems to have heard the, the voice. Mm. That's revelation. That's a gift. Some thought it thundered. Mm. Yeah, where he says, uh, the word of God at the ear is a whisper, and at the mouth it is a shout. Yes. So, where he keeps talking there, where it's not, all do not hear, all, all cannot hear, all are not supposed to hear. Right. Some people are to hear and then present. Yeah. And and then, that is that saying basically like, so God may, again, using, you know, a minister, preacher, conveyor, to present the message to somebody who initially would not otherwise hear that and then through them? Well, I think what he's trying to get at at that point, when because what he's doing now is he's changing from those who don't hear because of uh, the gift of revelation to, uh -huh. to say that the preacher is often gifted this gift of revelation for the purpose of helping the people to see it that don't see it yeah. by, by articulating it in a different way. And he says shouting from the housetops, but right. I, I think because of preaching's checkered past, a lot of times people think that means if you don't shout while you're preaching, you're not preaching, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, that is obviously the truth in a, a Pentecostal church or Pentecostal context. But what he says here to preach in a whisper is to be seduced by the deadly heretical equation. All do not hear equals all cannot hear equals all are not supposed to hear such a line of thought turns the gospel into a secret, the church into the elite and Jesus into a riddle rather than a parable. True. Some of the seed is sown among those who won't hear, obviously rocks, weeds, you know, whatnot, what have you. But the fact does not justify holding tightly to the seed until one has located good soil that will guarantee a full harvest. We are not ordained to exercise such careful selectivity in our preaching. This selectivity is precisely the era of the early church uh, Gnosticism. This idea that some get the gospel and some don't, so don't even worry about those who don't. What he's saying is spread the gospel broadly and spread it freely. Preach it to everybody without hesitation, without worry, without concern. Let it fall where it falls, and then let God do that gift of rev revelation that, that he would do. And some, you're right, won't hear. But um, it, is a, it is a danger of the church to get – I mean, the church actually got it at that point one time. Calvinism taught that, you know, the elect get saved and the non-elect don't. Right. And so um, back in the day, you know, they said that grace was irresistible. And so the elect are going to be saved whether they like it or not, and the damned are going to be damned whether they like it or not. And right. so there was a uh, conference where they were having where somebody in the Southern Baptist Church stood up and said, you know, the Bible talks about being missionaries and going and carrying the gospel. And we need to go to pagan lands and, you know, all over the world, Africa and places like that and tell them about the gospel. Well, one guy, one old minister stood up and said, young man, God is sovereign and the elect will be saved and the unelect will be damned. So when God decides to save those pagans in Africa, he will save them you know, whether you go and tell them or not. So basically, you know, their theology was you don't need missionaries because God will save whoever God wants to save. Well, but, yeah, I mean, if that was the case, you wouldn't need hardly anything. Exactly. Would you? Why do you go to church then, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, goodness. Exactly. 
So uh, I think what he's trying to get at there is uh, the whisper that you heard that revelatory moment in in the study in the private has to turn into an articulation. And he, he's using the word shout because it does say in the gospel that uh, we should shout it from the rooftops. Don't try to hide it under a bushel basket. Right, right. But make it clear, you know, articulate it. And in all honesty, the way it was probably done in the first century, the, the word gospel means good news. Uh, right. Uangelion means good news. So, um, you know, it's almost like the town crier in uh, the Middle Ages, the boy that was selling the newspaper, you know, he's running along, hear ye, hear ye. Yeah. You know, here's the newspaper, two shillings, uh, read all about it, read all about it. King George has passed a law that says you can't blah, 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 or whatever. So that's what a preacher is. A preacher is the the town crier running through with the newspaper, holding it up, saying, here, 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 everybody here, you know. Okay. And I love what he says on page 61 about what our role in what God is doing in reconciling the world and to himself is. He says, uh, in the present context, the disciples are not to wait for the eschatological reversal of the world the way it is, but we are to participate in it, Mm. making present the future. And that's that proleptic uh, thought that we learn about in theology class where, you know, the gospel is that the kingdom is already come and it's already here, even though it's not in its fullness and it will not be in the fullness until the eschatological ramifications of God come in, you know, and, and making all things right. So right. Uh, the way they talk about it in theology oftentimes is this, this proleptic already, but not yet. You know, um, Jesus said some Pharisees came to him and said, tell us where the kingdom of God is. Show it to us and we'll believe that you're the Messiah. He says, why are you asking me about the kingdom of God? Open your eyes and look all around you. Don't you see it? It's where the, People are looking after the widows and the people are looking after the orphans. There it is right there. And here it is right here. And it's already within you. Hmm. But Rome was still ruling the roost at the time. So while the kingdom of God was already there, it was in competition with the kingdom of Caesar. And that really was the rub in the first century, which a lot of people don't understand in the church. Unfortunately, uh, people oftentimes tell preachers they need to shut up talking about politics because, the, you know, in uh, America we talk about separation of politics or the yeah. church and the state. But it never was meant to keep the church out of politics. It was meant to keep the politicians out of the church. Right. You know, that we'd not have a state-run church that says this is what you must do and must believe. But we as people of faith are supposed to have a word about how the society is run uh that's politics and jesus certainly had a politic he said here's what you know the kingdom of god looks like and here's what you you know so you know to call caesar lord was to say jesus wasn't to say jesus was lord to say caesar wasn't so that's what got a lot of christians killed in the first century and that was highly political so um we need to help our people understand that through that theology but we also need to make sure that they're hearing that there is a new world. It's already here and it's coming in its fullness. And uh, we're supposed to be a part of it. <clears throat> yeah, it was, it was talking also, I think this is page 63 where it's talking about that. Kind of what you already had said is like um, the message that's to be shouted is the one that's been heard. Right. Which eliminates the noisy borrowings of what others have heard already. Mm-hmm kind of eliminating some of the noise from the background and, and bringing to the forefront the truth. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, um, <clears throat> there was, uh, some art back about 10 years ago or so that was pretty prevalent in some of the Christian stores. Uh, there was one right here in the Newburn Newburn uh, mall. I wish I could get my hands on one. Now it was 3d, um, 3d type art. But mm-hmm. you, if you looked at the, the picture, you would swear there was nothing there but a bunch of squares or a bunch of shapes. It would be squares. It could be circles. It could be a lot of different things. Sure. But if you relaxed your eyes enough and just kind of uh, zoned out for a second and didn't focus on the, the art itself, what you would see is that inside the picture, a, a 3D something came out at you. It almost looked like it stood off the page. 
and oh. they had one where Jesus was on the cross, right? And I'm standing there looking at it, and the lady at the, art, at the place was trying to tell me how to see it, and the more she tried to tell me, the more frustrated I got because I was trying to relax my eyes, and I was trying to make it happen. It wouldn't happen, and all of a sudden, I saw it, and I was like, oh, my God, I just saw it, and it was like Jesus on the cross, right? She's like, that's it. And I was like, I can't see it now. I can't see it. I was trying to yeah, you know, yeah. make it happen. It wouldn't happen. Eventually, I got to the point where I could see it fairly quickly because I, would, I knew how to let it, my eyes relax to see it. But now I was like, throwing my wife, I was like, hey, look at this. She's like, I don't see anything. I don't see anything. All I see is these little triangles. I was like, yeah. abstract art. You know, that, that was what it was all about. Sure. But uh, that's the point. It's like you say, to try to let the clutter to be clarified so that you can see what's right there in front of you and that you can't seem to get because of all the clutter around it. Right. You know, somehow we got to try to help people to come to that. And that is that revelatory moment. That is that sense of aha. And again, Craddock says it best when he says later in this same textbook, he's going to tell you when you as the preacher have that revelatory moment, you need to try to begin to think about crafting the sermon in such a way as to help the congregation have that same moment. Mm. So how do you help them relax their eyes so they can see the 3D picture pop out to them like you saw it? Right. And it's going to be difficult. It's not always easy. Um, and yeah. it's not always, I mean, you know, like I said, I, I really do harp on this a lot because in my tradition, I think there's some ministers who think that if you're not hollering and, and doing damage to your vocal cords, then you're not really preaching. Um, but on page 63, he says, uh, and, and this is the one, two, three, fourth paragraph down where he says, even so, it starts off, even so, yeah. uh -huh. we call from the housetops, we make a public proclamation and properly so. Again, a reminder, shout is not to be taken literally, but as a symbol for an open, universally available quality of preaching. In fact, a loud, it may be loud or soft and still qualify. A quiet voice through the cabin door saying, President Lincoln just says that we're free is still no less than a shout than 76 trombones running down Main Street on the 4th of July. Right, right. So, I mean, it's the quality of what's being said as to whether it's got that power punch. Yeah. You, know? yeah. um, you will never hear in that video that I just sent you of Fred Craddock preaching, you yeah. will never hear him raise his voice above a normal monotone voice like me and you are talking right now but it's some of the best preaching that I've ever heard in my life. In fact, when he gets through at the end, he just, sometimes Craddock is really famous for just dropping the mic and turning and walking away. Like he just said the most powerful thing. And he says, okay, you know, you just sit, you just sit with that and think on that for a minute. I'm going to go ahead and leave. You know, he doesn't say it. He just does it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And uh, I had tears, man. I had goosebumps. I would heard that sermon. I bet, 10 times because I preached this class. Every time I teach this class, I share that sermon with the students, obviously, uh, because yeah. he wrote the textbook, you know, sure. but man, I'm telling you, I'm sitting there watching this sermon and I'm thinking, Oh my gosh. And he's got, he got me again. I mean, he obviously crafted that sermon in such a way that what happened to him in the study when he actually had the realization again, maybe for the first time in a long time, that salvation was more than just getting your soul right for the eternity but it actually has a whole lot to do with how we live as Christians now. Mm -hmm. um, when he dropped that bomb at the end, it, it catches me every daggone time. So, it, I mean, it's, okay. it's a masterpiece. Wow. Awesome. Man. Can't wait. <laughs> yeah, I, put on, I, I shared it on Facebook. Uh, I said, look, I know I shared this uh, sermon the last three or four years several times. Yeah. Every time I see it, I, I, I feel compelled to share it again because I feel like somebody needs to hear it besides just me. Mm -hmm. And I said, man, Fred Craddock was a master, master wordsmith. Uh, we lost him a couple of years back now, but, man, he was he was phenomenal. And, and by the way, he's got a bunch of stuff on YouTube, so if you got some extra time and you just want to do some, you know, just research on the guy who's wrote our textbook for this class, just kind of get a sense of who he is. Uh, there's a bunch of, uh, like, two- to three-minute little short videos where they interview him. They'll ask him a question, he'll answer and that's the end of that video. And it's, it's kind of like okay. a, you see he's dressed in the same clothes. So you see several videos on the YouTube queue. So, um, yeah, you'll enjoy that. Yeah, for sure. Let's um, see. 
Uh, I wrote very important on the top of page 65 for something. So let me read that and see what that was. Sure. One must not forget that there are two kinds of preaching, difficult to hear, poor preaching, and good preaching. Mm. Oh, yeah, okay. That is very important. <laughs> um, let's see. Understand nothing is intended to encourage those feverish and frustration born attacks on a parishioner, uh, on one's parishioners in order to provoke counterattack, in order to feed the martyr complex or to confirm that one is a prophet. The subject here is nothing more, nothing other than preaching the gospel. So in other words, he's saying, don't go in the pulpit just to try to pick a theological fight, but don't shy yeah. away from ever saying that something that might end up causing you to be a martyr. Right. I've seen preachers who had to leave a congregation because of something they said from the pulpit, but they would never go back and second guess it. I mean, being yeah. faithful to God is more important than, you know, having a job. All right. Absolutely. So, all right. That leads us over to chapter four. Yeah. Now chapter four, like I said, I mean, this was, you know, I mean, it's pretty outlined pretty well. I thought, you know, with the different yeah. points going through, um, you know, talking through the traditional leadership and, and the nourishment and, and being service and um, not necessarily getting away, but instead you know, not getting away from the daily work, but getting into it. Yes. Uh, looking at it from that approach. Uh, yeah. You remember what I said about some people do uh, ministry to try yeah. to get away from work. Uh, right. I've, literally, I've literally heard um, and, and not, not like a, an individual person that I know of, but I mean, I've heard uh, horror stories of people who say, you know, that their minister is pretty much, they go to the movie theater during the middle of the week and just watch movies. They're on the golf course. They, I mean, you know, I've only got to show up to Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, my congregation is not going to boot me. So, wow. so once in a while I might make a, make a visit to a hospital or something, but uh, wow. or spending time in the study, you know, I, I did my couple of years in, uh, undergraduate and got my degree so now i feel like i'm i'm, I'm fine now nah, man mm. it takes a lot yeah. of work to preach properly yeah. yeah yeah and that's what i was taking you know is uh where he was i'm not looking at it right now but i think it was talking about yeah like getting getting your study complete is not being complete like it's always ongoing it's never going to end Absolutely. you're always going you know if if you're doing it the proper way you're always going to be trying to find out more understand it more study yes. more from different contexts and angles and, and understanding. Yeah, always gonna, one of the things he says is reading good novels. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Right. I mean, uh, a lot of people don't think of that as studying for sermons, but man, if you're reading the Lord of the Rings, if you're reading the, the yeah. Hobbit, if you're reading the, you know, the Chronicles of Narnia or something like that, dude, you, you're getting some good information on how to turn a phrase. You know, you're talking about uh, good versus evil. You're talking about call and quest and all of these yeah. things that are theological, you know? Yeah. Like those, those actually in particular and some other, like there's this conference that I go to at, at the end of March. Yeah. Um, it's, it's got a lot of snippets and clips from a lot of those kind of movies. Yeah. You know, and they relate with the message Absolutely. as we're giving it and everything. So, yeah, that's definitely, you know, something I've seen over the years be used very uh, effectively, I would say. Absolutely. Um, I, I saw that, that area in there where he was talking about, you know, desks becoming altars, too. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just so much yeah. focus on that that it takes away from the rest of what you – need to be doing so there's balance yeah exactly you got to find a balance but in, in that gaining through those studies through the you know what you're talking about you know attaching all the different aspects to it gaining that confidence which is going to free you as a deliverer of the word yes um because yeah definitely <laughs> you know i mean you can definitely tell that somebody who's been you know, like yourself been in the word for, you know, a long time versus a newer preacher. Right. Um, who probably studied, you know, in the early term of, of doing it has studied just that. Just to get simple, ordained. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just that section of the context of the story, you right. know, 
and, and I'm sure that you'll probably be able to see that in Jacob and I, you know, like uh, we're more focused in this section of right, right. not being able to relate it to all the other aspects and, and historicals and different things. Um, so as game, you know, continuing to study in that and in, in the life of the study as it, you know, the chapter yeah. here yes. speaks to we would definitely, you know, allude to the, the, the knowledge being free, you know, because then you are able to relate a lot of things on just sheer knowledge, really. Um, you know, he keep, talks about um, how some ministers actually try to get out of doing the study by saying, you know, I'm just too busy to study. I don't have time. I got yeah. all the pastoral duties. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a that was a, a, a seminary professor somewhere before. I just heard the story. I, did, I wasn't a part of the class when it happened. But the uh, professor uh, brought in uh, like a, uh, a vase, a clear glass vase, and he had like three boxes of things to put in the vase. It was big, big rocks, some smaller pebbles, and some sand, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And he told him, he said, uh, you know, go ahead and fill it up and, and put the sand in there first, and then put the pebbles in, and then put the big rocks in, and they couldn't do it. So he said, okay, now take it back apart, and let's do it again. This time, let's put the big rocks in, and then put the pebbles in and shake it a little bit, put the sand in and shake it some more, and then you get everything in. And it's he's like, yeah. yeah. So he's like, what's the point? Obviously, the point is the big things have got to go first. And if you do yeah. the big things first, then you'll have time for the little things. But if you only do the little things first, you'll never have time for the big things. And right. the big things in a minister's life is prayer and devotion and making sure that they have their, you know, what we talked about a while ago, the, the minister having a faith and being authentic. If you're not having a prayer life, if you're not being authentic in your faith, then it's going to be very difficult for you to preach because then it just becomes a job, you right. know, and so it's not a calling. So go ahead and get the prayer, get that study time, get that in first. And like he says, if you, if you schedule that, then you'll have time for it. Yeah. You know, but if you don't schedule it, what you'll do is you'll go into your office and you'll sit down and you'll rearrange the pencils three, four or five different ways You'll get up, you'll sharpen some pencils, you'll come back, you'll move the tape dispenser, you'll see that the cartons look like they're kind of cockeyed or crooked or maybe the blinds aren't all running the right way. You get up and fold them. You need to make a cup of coffee right quick because you can't have, you got to have coffee. Before long, yeah. you've killed two hours doing nothing because you're just yeah. procrastinating, you know. And then you're like, well, I've been in here studying for a couple of hours, so I'm going to go uh, take a break. Yep. And the congregation right. hears you preach on Sunday, and they're like, you were studying for two hours for real for that? Yeah, yeah. yeah I can tell that's all you study. <laughs> Sounds like you really moved some pencils around or something instead. You know? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I, I took note of that, too, where it's like you got to, you know, time management, you know, dedicating – certain days, times, yes. you know, yeah. blocking that out, um, you know, taking it so that other things don't um, over, over blend there. And he yeah. actually even says in the video series that goes along with this, that uh, he used two different chairs. Uh, mm. One he used for study and it uh -huh. was hard and it was a rigid, it was a, uh, a like an office desk chair. It was, it, it was the, the chair itself connotes work. Mm. And uh, he said when he was in that chair, he knew that that's what he was supposed to be doing, looking up Greek words, looking up uh, history, context, social, political, background, and doing the work, doing the research. And then he had another chair, he said, that was more like a recliner. It was very plush, it was soft, it felt good. And he mm. said it was more for me to relax in and to reflect upon the work that I did in the work chair. So That's when he started theologizing, like trying to put a theology to the actual, like doing the synthesis and the reflection part yeah. of the exegetical move. So yeah. that's not a bad idea actually, because he said yeah. you, know, you get to the point where your body gets trained to know that I'm in the work chair, but I'm, I'm supposed to be nose to the grindstone. Yeah, yeah. Or I'm in the I'm in the fluffy chair now. I can just sit back and daydream and relax and think. How would this best be brought across? How would they How would they best understand that Jeremiah was you know standing in front of a king, being asked if there's a word from the Lord, knowing that the word that he had to tell the king, the king didn't want to hear, and the king had the power to kill him. Mm -hmm. You know, now I can talk about that and try to contemporize that in such a way that they would understand the fear, the horror, the dread that maybe Jeremiah would experience, you know? Yeah, for sure. Yeah. That, that's, that's interesting. That's good. Good. Uh, separation of those. Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's exactly what he was trying to do is like make a line a, a, a line of demarcation and separation. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> And it was going in and talk about, you know, some of the, you know, the novels we talked about earlier. Um, and the resistance to continuing to study once you have like a topic, you know, yeah. you're like, yeah. oh, I don't That's need to keep studying. Oh, I'm going to preach on. Let's just right. structure it and, and fire it out. Right. Yeah. That was, that was good. Um, and, and just even, once that occurs, maybe taking, you know, that's a good place to take a break to prepare your mind and, and prepare your, you know, your spirit for what you have to go after at that point. Let the creative and, juices start flowing. Yeah. And like you said, the the well that you have to draw from in creativity, and I even wrote it on page 78, I lack here because I do lack in reading short stories and poetry and novels. Yeah. I remember when I was forced to read uh, Moby Dick in uh, seminary, for a class that we were doing um, juxtaposition of uh, classical literature with the book of Jonah. So the book of Moby Dick is about, you know, um, Ahab that's chasing this white whale. And um, of course, Jonah is about a big fish that swallows a guy. Right. And in the book, Moby Dick, there was actually a, a couple of times that people fell off the boat, got swallowed by a whale. And then they finally got the whale on, you know, to the side of the ship, cut his belly open, got the guy out still alive. You know, so there's all these overtones and everything literarily to Jonah being in the belly of a whale coming out live after three days. Um, yeah. and, 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 you know, the other stuff that goes along with it. Man, I thought, where have I been all my life? You know, I, I've never read Moby Dick. I came through high school and I somehow missed it. They didn't make me read it there. Right. And if I'm not made to read something that's extra biblical, I probably won't. And as I right. read this, I'm still convicted as I read it now because I still need to read more broadly, you know? Oh yeah, me too. <laughs> um, I've got a colleague at work. Have you had any classes with Dr. John Blackwell? No, I haven't. Dr. Blackwell, you would really like him. He is a phenomenal individual. Um, and that guy has, uh, he's got several different uh, doctoral degrees, really. Um, some in literature, some in anthropology, some in art and some in uh, religion. So he's teaching in the religion mm -hmm. department, but all of those other things he sees as complementary to his religion degree mm -hmm. and what he does and what he teaches. And man, he sees connections and things that I never have. Because I mean, he's read these things, you know, he's always talking about Dante. He's always talking about Milton and, you know, um, all of these different things that I should have read a long time ago and haven't. So it, it's not a bad thing. Um, but see, if we're, if, if as a preacher we could see that this is actually part of our work and not see it as yeah. schlepping off and taking time for myself, yeah, you know, then you would actually probably push through and read it and say, Oh, this is actually going to benefit the ministry. Right. Right. Locate the library. Yeah. Yeah. Set, yeah. Locate the library, setting up your own library. Setting up your own library. Yeah. And, and yeah. I don't know about you, but when I was in uh, both undergraduate and then later in seminary, especially in seminary, I bought every textbook that the uh, professors had on the syllabus, even the uh, suggested ones, because we knew we wouldn't get to the ones in class that were suggested. And a lot of people said, well, if they're suggested, I'm not even going to buy them. I bought them. Because yeah. I said, I'm going to put them on my bookshelf so whenever I get out of seminary, I'll have something to draw from. Right. Yeah, for sure. The uh, taking advantage of available workshops and institutes and seminars. Yeah, I think that's huge. I, you know, it's, it's interesting as you get, obviously, when you're, you know, collegically going through something, you know, you're, you, you have your marks and your different things. This is a conversation I have with people at my, at my job and, you know, with my wife a lot is, yeah. you know, post education, like formal education in the regard of like collegiate. I, I almost think sometimes you get um, more from a seminar or workshop sometimes because there, there's not necessarily any kind of pressure to yep. meet anything. You're actually just taking in all yep. the information. You're able to process it 
without the pressure of, oh, I need to know this for that and then right. compartmentalizing it. Oh, how do I need to use this? Oh, I, I need to put that over here for this project or for this right. paper or for right. this presentation. And you're able to just take all that stuff in. And I think sometimes, you know, I tell her, I do look forward to the day where it's not about, you know, well, it's not that it's about this, but you know, that you don't have those attachments with it where it's like, Oh, Hey, you need to take on this, read this book because this is going to relate how you need right. to make this sermon. Yeah. You can listen. And, and, yeah. well, and this was, is almost kind of like that, you know, just this interaction here is almost like that game, you know, yeah. being able to lean and, and, and gain insight and, and understanding without it, you know, and taking that and being able to do these, these stuff from the syllabus, of course. But, you know, I think, I don't know. Maybe well, I, one of the things that I think is uh, involved in that whole thing. And this was something that was brought to my attention when I was at Duke in seminary, Dean Willie Jennings was the uh, vice president of academic affairs at the time up there. And he said, um, he came into our, our conference uh, in a conference we were having uh, when we first got there as first as students. And he said, guys, ladies and gentlemen, he said, um, I want you to learn everything you can possibly learn while you're here at Duke. He said, this is going to be a phenomenal experience. He said, but here's the thing. He said, at the end of the day, you're going to do your best to try to pass this class with such and such a grade. He said, I hate grades. He yeah. said, if I could do away with grades, he said, I would do, I think you would learn a lot more if you were just here studying and didn't have to worry about a grade. And I yeah. said, amen, brother. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, well, yeah. And that's like a, you say, when you go to a conference, you're not there worrying about a grade. You're not worried about a right to paper. You're not worried about this or that or the other. But because of SACs, and I understand, you know, we're, we're taking people's money. and we got to make sure we're giving a quality education. So they got to be able to see that we're actually doing what we say we're doing. So there's got to be a way of, you know, of, uh, you know, testing what we have done and making sure that we're communicating well. But I agree with you. I think that, you know, at, just like me at this seminar this past week, and I can't for the life of me understand why – we advertise this broadly through the Free Will Baptist with five, 400 ministers and like eight, nine show up. That's just beyond me. That is, yeah, that's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I mean, we've got this this culture in our church, in the Free Will Baptist Church, and because I are one of them, I can talk about them. Um, mm. There is this anti-intellectualism uh, that, and, and he mentioned this in an earlier chapter. I didn't bring it up, but Craddock did mention this. Uh, actually, in this chapter, the life of study, he said there's some people who worry that if you study, the more you study, the less you'll have faith or less you'll believe. Mm -hmm. That was early on in this chapter. He mentioned that. Um, and, and I just disagree with that wholly. I mean, I just there's just too much of me to understand how the early church fathers like knew Greek and Latin and rhetoric and all yeah. the things that we've let go by the wayside now, yeah. and I'm looking at how effective they were, and none of them said, oh, if I study more, I'm going to believe less, you know? <laughs> yeah. yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, that was, you know, a big, you know, when I saw it, and, and when I hear, like you said, you, you're going to have in, in a collegiate environment, you're going to have to make a, a way to get marks, and, and there's got to be a measurement and evaluation. Right. But, you know, there's nothing more reassuring to me when you have a teacher going over the syllabus and they're like, and they explain that, like, look, I understand we got to meet these marks. We're going to measure things based on this, but the ultimate goal in this class is for you to actually take something away from it and not just to be looking at the grade at the end of the five weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks or whatever the class is. Absolutely. So, Cause I feel like if, if every student in my class left my class with an A, but they did not get what they came for, then we've, right. We, we failed them, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Now, yeah. number 10, the last, the last note he mentions uh, is a very important one too. I don't know if you put much thought into this or not, but if you're going to be involved in pastoral ministry or even a Sunday school teacher mm -hmm. and you have to week by week study and prepare and get up a lesson or get ready to speak in front of a congregation or whatever, in front of a group, um, no sense in, in not making, you, you know, a filing cabinet is a very small expense, especially a small or two, two drawer filing cabinet, get a manila, a manila file for every topic, you know, uh, yeah. one for every book of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, every sermon you preach from one of those books, uh, as soon as you're finished with the research on it, put it right inside of that uh, envelope. 
Yeah, and I think <laughs> I've heard that from you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you knew I'm a believer in that. <laughs> yeah, in classes we've had before. Yeah, yeah. I've heard you, you know, saying, well, hey, you've done all the ex exegetical work on this. You're probably going to come across it again. Why would you want to put yourself going back right. through all that and doing it again? Just pull that out and refresh your mind and then yep. go from and and he's going to tell you in this book and in the video series if i can find it and get it so you and jacob can watch it he's going to tell you that when you do the exegetical work you're going to find that there's more than one sermon in the passage don't preach all sermons in one sermon you, your sermon is supposed to be the way that uh the preacher professor that taught me preaching way back in the day used to use uh he used the analogy of a uh, bird shot and a, and a rifle bullet he mm -hmm. said, a sermon is supposed to be a bullet, not birdshot. And the birdshot, right. you can shoot it up against the wall, and it's going to hit a lot of things, but nothing hard. Right. And if you get peppered with birdshot across the field, it ain't even going to hurt you. But you don't right. want to shot with a 270 across the field because it will hurt you. I mean, that bullet still got a lot of power. You know, right. it's, it's going to kill somebody. So if you want your sermons to be powerful, it needs to be one central bullet, one central topic, not right. five, you know, and, and that's one of the things – when we're doing the exegetical class, which I'm doing with some other people right now, we're talking about the etym etymological fallacy where a lot of times people will take a word like faith. And Paul says you're saved by grace through faith. Mm -hmm. And so there'll be preachers who will preach in one sermon that Paul says you're saved by grace and by faith. And they'll use those two words and they'll use every word in the dictionary. Say well, when Paul says faith, this is what he means. Well, in all honesty, most of the time when Paul uses faith in all of his writings, he has one or maybe two definitions out of those four or five different definitions or six or eight or ten definitions that, you know, a good Greek um, lectionary will give you. Mm. So it's, a, it's, it's actually an error to ascribe to Paul that for faith, when he mentions faith in this particular passage, he means this when he never meant that at all, you know, that's taking the passage out of his context. Yeah. So it's a lot of work to find out what it is that Paul usually meant when he said faith, because that's yeah. probably what he means here too. <clears throat> right. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, and, you know, just coming into this class, you know, one of the things that I see a lot, um, is the you know the different styles and like you said we're gonna you know come across a lot of that stuff as we go through here i'm um, sure as we progress through the book but you know you have your prosperity messages you have your you know everything is attached to you know like current what you're going through now right potentially may and so often and, and my wife and I and our family, we, you know, we've been at churches where it's been like that for, uh, 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 back around to a sermon again. And it's the same message yeah. and it's like maybe targeted towards newer believers where there's nothing deeper than just the surface of what that message is. And right. you're like, right. man, there's not even any kind of exegetical, like, explanation of what we're talking we're just reading passages and connecting it to the person's potential environment you know well, it's I call like, that is pop we need to pop christianity yeah it's like we need to understand what that meant then yes and how that can relate to now <laughs> like <laughs> like that's i that's just you know coming into this class you know that's something that my wife and i talk about a lot is mm -hmm. um and we just had a uh a friend of ours that uh, just launched a church um, not too far from here, up towards uh, Cary area, Chapel Hill area. And, you know, we went to their launch and, and, you know, I'm a, it's funny. I'm like, after the sermon, we're driving back home and, you know, after lunch and everything and, and I'm driving home, I'm like, oh, what'd you think? You know, we're talking about it. And I was like, well, I said, I've just found myself in, in a critique kind of mode every time I listen to a sermon since, you know, I've been yep. going to college for Absolutely. this field. Yeah. You know, so I'm always critiquing. I mean, I'm not doing it to be negative towards no, any no. individual, but I'm like, you know, I'm going to say it was a good message. There was scripture in it. Yeah. There was, there was the starting of describing exactly kind of why that scripture was there. But it's like for me and maybe, you know, it, I guess it's dependent upon the audience too. But for me, I, I put myself in those shoes. Like I would want to dig deeper in yes. connecting the why from then to the why it is effective now. Yep. 
Yeah. I mean, I mean, like all, I said, all this other stuff kind of goes into that. Too. Yeah. I mean, it's like I said a moment ago, you know, and, and Dr. Hines used to call that uh, Christianity light, like Miller light, you know, less filling. <laughs> and uh, yeah. the old saying is, you know, we don't always want what we need, but we always need what we need. And so uh, yes. what I have found is that a lot of our, a lot of the people I've spoken to over the years and preached to come to me and tell me, wow, man, you just bring a whole new level to the background and the history of that passage before you ever get into it. I love that. I need that. And, and I could easily sit back and say, well, they've not been to seminary and they are, they're not interested in all the history and culture of the Bible. In fact, they're very much interested in it. They just yeah. want it at a level that they can understand it. So that's my job is to try to translate it. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it, it's going to be interesting going through this and, and, you know, doing the different, uh, observations like for the television preachers and doing yeah. those things. And well, note, if you will, when you do the television preachers and I've tried to pick a couple that are more of a prophetic uh, voice, you know, there's a, there's a difficulty, uh, in pastoral ministry. You're called to both be a priest and a prophet. Um, a priest is a person who represents the people to God. Um, a, a prophet is those who speak to the people on behalf of God. So you got to, you got to carry the people to God in prayer. And that means you got to hold them in tenderness. And that means you got to be there beside them and hold their hands when they're going through the most difficult times of their life. That's what a priest does. But a prophet is the one who stands in their face and says, you know what? Um, I'm sorry, but I cannot justify the use of the N word in that story that you're telling, you know, uh, that's, that's a racist tendency that we got to overcome. Uh, Paul says that in Christ, we're all neither male nor female bond nor free Greek or Jew. All those distinctions have to be pushed away. And I'm not going to perpetrate, you know, perpetrate that by laughing at that joke. I just can't do that. And, and that's a prophetic witness. Right. That is a hard statement to say to somebody who's a friend of yours, and I know it's going to be embarrassing for them. It's going to be hurtful for them to hear it that way, but they might not, they might not like you. They might leave you, but yes. you know what? Your, your integrity is more important than, than anything else. Right. So, right. Um, so notice if you will, like I said, I've, I've thrown in a couple of uh, voices that are probably hard for hard voices to hear. Uh, I'm going to actually send another uh, preacher for y'all to watch next week. That is right there from goals. You live in Goldsboro or you work in Goldsboro? Yes. Uh, uh, both. Do you know uh, uh, Reverend Barber, uh, William J. Barber? Yeah, on um, William Street. African American preacher there in, uh, in Goldsboro. Yeah. He's been he's been on TV a lot. There's a lot of people who hate his guts. Yeah. Uh, he's been arrested a lot. A lot of people say he's nothing but a rabble rouser. Um, yeah. He has a particular uh, understanding of the of the theological tradition that he's preaching and, and advocating for. But uh, one of the things that I've always tried to help people to realize and to remember, every preacher, every preacher who was really a prophetic voice from God was hated by their generation. Um, Martin Luther King is all lauded now. We have a day for him, big statue on the Washington Mall. People love him. Not whenever he was here. Uh, yeah. Good Christian people were telling him to shut down and shut up and be quiet and, you know, stop yeah. that race talk and all that other kind of stuff. So, uh I just wonder sometimes if there's prophets among us that God has still sent to us, not the sense that Jeremiah and, and, and Isaiah, you know, obviously we don't take their words and canonize them and make them Bible. But right. I mean, when I say prophets, I mean, I'm, I'm talking about people who speak prophetically, who call us to account. Right. So. Okay. All right, buddy. Well, that's chapter four. Um, anything else you need before I sign off? Cause if not, we're good to go until next week this time. Um, so for next week, we need to have the 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 paper done for the for one, one of the uh, one online of your, sermons. Yes, one of your preachers. Okay, you got one next week, one the week after that. You All got right. uh, the worship service attendance that's due like the fourth night of class, but you can turn it in whenever you do it. Okay, and uh, then the two sermons that you are crafting um, for actually delivering. Right. And of course, then, you know, we're talking, you know, the, the actual in-class lecture time. I tell you what I did is I actually cut the uh, record button on, on this session about uh, when we got through with the introduction. 
and I'm okay. going gonna, gonna to contact Jacob and just let him watch what we've done tonight because I think him being a part of this conversation would be just as good as me and him sitting down and having to, me having to go through this conversation again. I think Absolutely. we'll benefit from it. So, Okay. All right. Well, buddy, if I don't see you before, uh, I'll see you next Thursday night, but hopefully I'll be in contact via email or otherwise. All right, sir. I appreciate right. it, doctor. Thank All you, right. John. Thank you. Have a good one, man. You too. All right. Bye-bye.